Sawete Miki, welcome back to the channel, or if you're new here, hi. My name is Sabrina and I'm going into my second year of studying classics at the University of Oxford. So if you're a massive classics nerd like me, or maybe someone who's potentially interested in applying for classics at Oxford, or you know, just curious about my university lifestyle in general, feel free to hit the subscribe button down below and join me on my university journey. In this week's video, I'm going to be doing a deep dive and analysis into the Secret History by Donna Tartt because I read this book for the first time around a month ago and I know what you're gonna say, Sabrina you're a classic student, how have you not read this book before? And to that I say, I am a fool <laughs> and I put off reading this book, I was aware of this book, for some reason I put off reading it, I don't know why, I think it's because there was so much hype around it, especially because there's a whole like dark academia thing themed around this book and I was like, Am I going to become the stereotype of the classic student that loves the secret history and wears dark academia clothing? And the answer to that is yes. So <laughs> now that we've got that out of the way, I want to say that I have not been able to stop thinking about this book since I've read it. It's always there in the back of my head when I go to do or read anything else, including my very much <laughs> prioritised schoolwork or uni work that I need to do for October. I get distracted. I can't concentrate because all the things I can think about are to do with this book. The plots, the characters, classics, knowledge, mythology, symbolism, everything. I mean, it's basically a gold mine for classicists. I have so many thoughts that I want to share, so many ideas that I want to discuss. And I thought, instead of subjecting my poor friends to a long rambling rant about a book that most of them haven't even read, I might as well come on here, come onto the internet, put my thoughts out into the void. I can discuss and share ideas with people who actually have read the book and that I can also offer my own unique perspective as a classic student reading this book and the things I was able to kind of pick up from that so that if you aren't necessarily super well acquainted with the classical world, you can maybe learn something new because I think understanding the classical references in the text really does help you enjoy the book a bit more or if you are a connoisseur of Greek mythology and classics references enjoy at least the discussion and someone voicing some new points that I haven't really seen talked about as much online. This video is going to be very informal, there's no real rhyme or reason or the structure doesn't really make any sense I'm just sort of going off the random notes that I took after I finished reading the book but nevertheless I still think you'll enjoy this video if you enjoyed the secret history so let us proceed. Okay, so the first thing that I thought I'd bring up and discuss a little bit more is the actual title of the book itself because whilst The Secret History, you know, it sounds like a pretty cool title for a book anyway, you already have the connotations of like a murder mystery going on, there is actually a really relevant classical reference that is being made that I don't think is an accident. Donna Tartt is the sort of writer that pays attention to detail so I think she was very much aware of what she was doing but essentially The Secret History shares its namesake with an ancient Byzantine text writing about Emperor Justinian and his family. I'll put up a photo here while I read the back of the summary of the Penguin classic book that I found in Waterstones the other day. Procopius was a trusted member of the Byzantine establishment whose official works glorify the deeds of Emperor Justinian, yet all the while the dutiful scribe was working on a book that could never be published during his lifetime, The Secret History, a sustained assault exposing the horrific tyranny and corruption of the Emperor's regime. Here Justinian is a demon king capable of any evil deeds, while his wife, Empress Theodora, is a bloodthirsty monster of depravity and cruelty, and the celebrated general Belisarius is the foolish dupe of his scheming wife Antonina. Magnificently vitriolic and startlingly original, the secret history is a work of explosive energy depicting Holy Byzantium as hell of murder and misrule. So you can already see the sort of similarities that we might infer between the two books, in particular this description of this group of elite people that from the outside everyone thinks is perfect and amazing, but on the inside that's when you can start to see the horror and corruption and decay that goes on. If Donna Tartt intentionally named her book after this ancient text then I think that was such a clever move on her part because not only does the actual title of the novel foreshadow the whole plot but you wouldn't be able to guess it unless you knew the correct reference to this random obscure ancient text which really sums up the pretentiousness of the whole book and also of the characters and that's why I also think it's perfect but it also reminds us of the unreliability of the narrator and that we should be wary of listening to exactly what Rich is going to say just as we should be wary when we're reading Procopius's version of events because they all have their own twisted ways of seeing the world and it isn't necessarily a reflection of what is actually going on. I just think it's too much of a coincidence to be accidental or non-intentional so 
I'm going to give the credit to where credit's due, which is to Donna Tartt for that decision. And I think it really just sums up her writing so well. She's really thought about every single detail. And for that reason, I just love this book. Okay, so the next really big classicsy point that I want to make is actually about the structure of the novel itself, which I think is one of the most interesting parts of Donna Tartt's writing. She's made this intentional choice to structure her novel like that of a Greek tragedy that you might find from Euripides or with Aeschylus. So I have written here, the Greeks are not so much concerned with what happened. In the prologue, the audience is usually aware of everything that is going to happen, but the consequences of the terrible deeds and Hamash's create dramatic irony, and that still makes it incredibly psychologically thrilling and gut-wrenching to watch. Like these ancient Greek tragic figures, the five are painted as larger-than-life heroic figures at the start of the novel by Richard. And just like Orestes, just like Oedipus, we see their fall from grace like these noble main protagonists. There is no happily ever after, no real resolution to the problem for them in a good way. I mean, look at our, look at our characters. Henry is dead by suicide, Bunny's dead because the others murdered him. Francis is unhappily married and in the closet, I guess, because otherwise he's going to be cut off from his inheritance. Richard is unhappy because Camilla doesn't love him or she doesn't want to be with him, so he just goes and lives his drab life somewhere in California. Camilla and Charles, who before were like this, have been separated and probably for a good thing. I mean, Charles is an alcoholic and an abuser, but Camilla as well, her love, Henry, is now dead. There is no happily ever after for these characters, and in a way, it is the comeuppance that they deserve for having committed such an atrocity of killing Bunny. I guess you could see it as they're being metaphorically chased by furies, just like the characters in Greek tragedy in reality actually are, like Orestes, but this time there is no deus ex machina moment. There's no god like Athena coming in to save the day. It is very much a tragic, ending and some people have expressed disengruntlement with this ending but I actually think it's quite fitting. It's really what they all deserve and I think the overall message that Donna Tartt is trying to come across is that all actions have consequences and all consequences will catch up to the people that have committed these crimes. So overall there is some sort of sense of divine justice. And if we move on to discussing Euripides' back eye we can see exactly how heavily Donna Tartt has been influenced by that play and that Greek tragedy in her own writing. Obviously you have the whole image and motif of the Bacchic revelry and that awakening suppressed emotions within one that are uncontrollable. So throughout the book characters are in a state of intoxication or even a different headspace. I mean the motif of alcohol is everywhere throughout the secret history and that is very much linking back to this idea of Dionysus and the wine and the revelry and the craziness and hallucinations and everything throughout. So people being completely out of their minds. I've been trying to find like corresponding characters and who reflects who and which situation and I've kind of come to the conclusion that I think Pentheus in Euripides' Bacchae is Bunny in this situation. So Bunny we know to be a pretty unsympathetic character, Pentheus the same way, and in some ways, as we go through both the play and the novel, we can understand the main character's feelings of animosity towards them and why they might be seen as deserving of death. But when we take a step back from the situation and we look at how they sort of violently die, I know Pentheus dies a little bit more violently than Bunny, they're still not deserving of such a horrific fate in the sense that they shouldn't have been murdered. <laughs> that it wasn't really entirely justified for them to die in the way that they did. And much of our sympathy, like Pentheus, does come from the grief that the parents and the family feels and the reaction of the people around the person who dies. So whilst Bunny and Pentheus themselves aren't necessarily super likeable characters. We do feel great sympathy for their deaths, for their parents and their families and their friends to have experienced such a horrific event. I still think Pentheus and Bunny pretty, pretty well correspond pretty well correspond, especially if we look at Henry like Dionysus. Henry's depiction in particular is very, it's very eerie in a way, like he's very cold and calm and collected most of the time but he comes into this sort of ferocity and bloodthirstiness and we're not used to seeing him express such great emotions it's like he becomes larger than life he, he tries to become like this sort of godlike figure morally great isn't really constrained by the same rules of morality as the rest of us mortals and that's why i think it's quite interesting to see them too as the comparison or corresponding characters i mean i have it written here that they're prone to overwhelming bursts of anger and frustration with cruel and dire consequences 
and they do almost both appear inhumane at points. I mean, Dionysus is literally a god, but Henry's still immortal. But he's kind of retracted himself into this cold shell of a person, and they act out of a desire to avenge their honour. Dionysus because his revelries haven't been accepted into Thebes, and Henry because he's sick and tired of Bunny using him and disrespecting him and taking his money and then threatening him about the murder they committed in the woods. Although saying that, making Henry Dionysus does kind of come into conflict when we're talking about Julian as a Dionysus nicest figure but some people have theories that he is the sort of fifth figure that is involved in the first murder the Dionysus figure but you know I think you can be open to both interpretations I mean I don't I don't know which one is really that much more convincing than the other and in a way excluding Richard all of the main five characters are supposed to embody these ideals of ancient Greek youth and we have Donatart making a specific mention of how Julian picks his students in a very weird and elitist way he puts loads of emphasis on making sure that they come from these rich families, that they're charismatic, that they're young, that they're beautiful. And in a way, they're kind of supposed to embody this idea of kalagophos, the ancient Greek concept that equates the morality and superiority of the morality of the soul with outward appearance. So the original pretty privilege, if you will, the idea that you are going to be a morally great person just because you look good on the outside. And I think Donatart really took that concept and decided to try and undermine it and show how it's wrong, you know, that evil people can have beautiful facades. So maybe she's trying to show the dangers of applying glamorized ancient concepts to modern life and the way that we shouldn't just, you know, take them all at face value. So we have the ancient Greek tragedy structure, but then we also have Homeric motifs and this is one of them I picked out, which I found was really interesting. So at the end of the book, Henry appearing in Richard's dream is really really similar and reminiscent of Achilles appearing to Odysseus in the Odyssey and Henry appears as this disgruntled ghost, he's not particularly happy with dying, he's just kind of like eh, and it's the same thing as Achilles really in the Odyssey and I thought that was quite interesting as a motif to end on, to really show that none of the characters got a happy ending none of them, even in death, they weren't happy. So I already kind of briefly mentioned this a bit before when I was talking about the origin of the secret history as a name, but Richard as the unreliable narrator and outsider has such a big impact on the novel. When you start realizing how skewed our view and perception of the situation actually is and how much he doesn't know and how much we still don't know about the characters and who knew what and if Julian was in on it, anything like that, it's all kind of still left up in the air. So we see the group through his eyes first and we're drawn into romanticizing them too and I definitely felt this when I was reading the book. I was just there like, I want to be part of this group of friends in the first half. In the first half. I did not want to be part of the murder, thank you. This is a disclaimer. But you definitely feel like drawn in by the same sort of glamour and charisma and just ambiance of the whole novel or at least the first half of the novel and you want to be part of that group and that clique and that culture too and we want to feel involved and included and aware of all the secrets so we're very much in Richard's position just like he wants to be involved in that group we're also on the outside looking in and I think that's why it's so interesting because we still don't fully know all the group dynamics either we still don't know entirely everything that went down so it comes as like a huge shock to us as much as it does to Richard really when these idealized figures start to show their true faces and their true personas and then you start to think how much were they really like what we thought they were or was that all just what Richard made them out to be he glamorized them he romanticized them to the extent where they weren't really humans anymore they were kind of these perfect storybook figures but actually when we look back on it they start to unravel in front of us and we're drawn further into the group and we see how rotten it actually is from the inside versus the glamorous appearance on the outside and this is Tart really sticking a knife into the whole concept of Calagophos. I mean I think it's especially the case of the Macaulay twins, Charles, Camilla, they're both wearing white clothing I think most of the time that's how they're described and yet they hide such evil in their hearts although would you call Camilla evil um mm, this is the thing this is the thing right so Charles oh I felt so betrayed by him second half of the novel turned alcoholic abusive and the incest was revealed and it was all just like ugh, it went down the drain so fast but I felt as betrayed by Richard partly because I think we were all led astray by Richard's descriptions I mean in the first half of the novel the twins were the ones that were the most welcoming towards Richard within the group you you had Bunny, who was kind of insecure and a bit jealous of Richard, potentially taking his place, so he wasn't the nicest guy to him most of the time. Francis was a bit eh, and Henry was kind of standoffish and aloof most of the time. But the twins were the ones that kind of, you know, were welcoming him in and like making him feel a bit more like he was part of the group. And to have that like betrayal or at least complete reversal of character, like what happened with Charles in particular, 
Whew. It was a proper stab to the heart. In the first half, he's beautiful, gentle, kind, and then there's the switch, and then suddenly he's an abusive alcoholic monster who coerces Camilla into incest and stabs her with a cigarette butt and wants to go around trying to kill Henry when he takes Camilla away from him. But is this a crazy mania induced by the guilt and the repercussions of Bunny's murder? So was he always like this, brimming under the surface and just needed something to release it, or is this all just a result of the murder itself? That's something to think about. I don't know. I don't know. I find it hard to believe that you can have such a big character switch like that unless something really traumatic has happened. I guess you could say Bunny's death was pretty traumatic, but also the incest was going on before the second half of the book, so it's probably going on for a long time, and he seems to have been a little bit abusive beforehand if we look back on the clues as to things being shattered against the walls in their house and stuff, so I'm not too sure about Charles. Either way, I felt betrayed by him. And Camilla, well, obviously she's better than Charles. I mean, it's not that hard. She also isn't a great person. And that comes back to the point of how everyone in this book is pretty much a terrible person. She, at one point, kind of committed incest voluntarily. She is happy to excuse the murder of the farmer, as most of them do. Doesn't really feel too much guilt about that. Um, although they did say that she went kind of mute after the first murder for a while. But then she loves Henry and is ready to excuse him killing Bunny so she can be with him. It's kind of ironic because Camilla is actually an old Latin name which refers to the little girl that would help out the priestess with her sacrifices and holy pious duties and things so it's really kind of referring to the pure one, the young maiden and with that knowledge when you look back on who Camilla is and what she's done you see that the way that she's been built up by Richard to be this pure one but actually that's not the reality at all and she is completely the most romanticized out of all of them I would say. I think it's also notable that Camilla is a famous character in the Aeneid. In the second half of the poem she appears as this famous warrior princess who's here to help save the Italians and she's one of the only female characters that is held on the same sort of equal level status as the men and I think that really does apply here with the book as well when you think about it she's the only girl in that group of boys. And I think we can see these connotations of the warrior princess actually rubbing off on the Camilla in the secret history because not only is she described as boyish at times but she's also sort of this heartless person. I mean she she is involved in two murders guys. She went down to check on Bunny's body with Henry as well as the farmer's body so she's pretty she is pretty heartless. All of the characters in the secret history are terrible people really. <laughs> But I think the twins really stood out to me because of the fact that they do feel like they fall in the most from Grace. Tart using them as the criticism for showing how someone's true moral character isn't necessarily what they show on their outside. I definitely see the secret history as a criticism of the elitism within studies and practices in academia and classics in particular. I mean, you even have the whole disturbance of the fact that no one is really that bothered or surprised by the incest apart from Richard. And he doesn't, he just internalizes it and kind of is like, okay, everyone else is cool with it. I guess I'm cool with it too. In the sense that they're just like, ah, oh, yeah, it happens. Like, this is not normal. This is not okay. It's almost like they've become so enamored with these ancient concepts. So obviously in Greek mythology there's a lot of incest. In tragedy there's a lot of incest. In classics in general you read about a lot of incest or these people accusing each other of incest. And it's like they've just taken these ancient concepts and just normalized them say like oh yeah this happens whatever and i think that's another example of how wrong it can be to try and adopt ancient practices into modern life incest be gone we don't need it anymore we never did but especially not now make it stop please and i guess the final thing that i just want to touch upon is my own experience and my own relations to this book and why i connected with it so deeply i go to oxford and i study classics at oxford the actual oxford system really reminds me of this book in the sense that we are taught in very small groups and we're taught with although we have more than one tutor we are taught with you know not that many teachers really and we're taught in groups of maybe two three even at times by yourself so it is quite an intense learning experience. So that was one reason why I connected to the book because I was like, this is how I get taught, ha <laughs> ha, relatable. But also I related to Richard in the fact that I sometimes felt a bit out of place at Oxford, not necessarily because of anything that anyone had specifically done, but just because of the environment. So basically imposter syndrome, which I'm sure a lot of people experience at university. And I have a little bit I can't lie, I did, especially I think in the sort of first term I was so overwhelmed, I was like, oh my god, all these amazing people around me. So not only in the sense that people are so clever, but also like there is a certain background that tends to study classics and I am not that background. 
and therefore my first real exposure to that level of wealth and privilege was at university and that's not to say that people aren't incredibly lovely and most people are no matter what you know wealth status they have and with that obviously some people are going to be a little bit more snobby majority aren't which is great but some people are it does take some getting used to trying to adjust your perspectives and make sure that you stay grounded and that you understand like what is the value of money or like what is reality when you have this level of wealth around you and therefore I was able to understand Richard's feelings really well when he was talking about you know feeling this incessant need to try and fit in and make sure that he doesn't stand out from the others or that he's clever enough that he's rich enough and for him he invents stories right he makes up this pretense but I haven't done that. Believe you me, I've not done that. But I do understand where he's coming from. Anyway, that was a long-winded rant and I hope you guys got something of use out of that or you at least enjoyed. If you have anything further to add to the discussion, add it in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the book. I will be reading them. If you leave a good one, I will argue back or I won't or I'll agree. Who knows? Can't predict me. I'm unpredictable. <laughs> but yeah, this book... 10 out of 10 really wanting to reread it at the moment although i have just bought this one if we were villains and i'm already super invested like it's basically the english literature version of the secret history you know shakespeare and plays and everything so maybe i'll do another one in the future I'm trying to tease some classical references out of this one but we shall have to see but anyway i hope you guys have enjoyed this video if you did let me know down below but i hope you have a lovely rest of the week i hope you have a lovely productive rest of the week and i'll see you in my next video bye